first, before anything else, let me ask if you had any questions from your readings for this week. And there they sat stunned for some moments. Do you like the book? Do you feel good about it? Today's reading is a lot better than the last course I've taken, which was about three semesters ago. Okay, well, it's, it is easy reading. It's very much more of a devotional kind of thing. And so, um, you know, not academically very intense. Some of you are in the Philosophical Theology class, which meets on Fridays. That book is a little tougher. <laughs> Balance the two out. Yeah, exactly. Between the two of them, then <laughs> going there. So, um, okay, so no questions or, or anything like that. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with the content for today. Father God, we're truly grateful again for your grace. Thank you for allowing us to gather. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would direct what is said and what is heard that you might be honored by it. Teach us what it means to be stewards of your great gifts to us, Lord, and what it means for us to commit our whole life to be all in for you. So we give ourselves into your care, asking your Holy Spirit to teach us that we might grow closer to you and love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, practical theology. I'm going to do a little bit this morning in terms of um, reminding you what practical theology means. Several of you uh, were here last week, so we'll pick that up why the class is called Practical Theology. This is the outline for our course. This is what's on your reading sheets. Again, if you didn't get one, you can pick one up. Last week we did a basic introduction. Today we're going to, and from here on out, we basically um, are talking about stewardship. Again, we'll talk, discuss again this morning what that actually means. It doesn't just mean money, which is what most people think. When uh, most people talk about stewardship sermons, they mean talking about giving because you need money for something. We're talking about whole life stewardship, and so we'll get into what that means. It's not just about giving. So we're going to look at various, through this course, various aspects of our Christian life that we have an obligation to be good stewards of. Today we're going to talk about call and vision, God's call on our life and what it means to have a Christian vision. Next week, faith and commitment. On September 4th, we are not having classes that week. This class will not meet on September 4th. Philosophical Theology will not meet on September 5th. Carolyn and I are going to be in Wisconsin to celebrate her dad's 102nd birthday. And I, I keep saying, but some of you haven't heard it, that we figured since he's 102, he's not going to have more than 15 or 20 more of these, so we feel like we need to be there when we can. But he still lives alone. He's doing great. So we're going to go and see him. Um, we will come back on September 11th. No symbolism to that at all to talk about time and opportunities, then resources, influence, and then sort of a call to action in the first hour before our final exam. As most of you know, you will get a document called What You Need to Know from Practical Theology on the fifth week, which means you'll get it on the September 18th, which will give you everything you really need to know from this class, um, especially in preparation for the exam. Well, it's everything you need to know, and you should study it whether you take the exam or not. But it'll be a synopsis of all what I think is the critical stuff. So you'll be receiving that on September 18th, give you a couple of weeks to study it. I do encourage you to take the exam. You have to take it if you're taking this class for credit, meaning for a certificate or a degree. But I recommend you do it anyway, because you'll learn more. And so uh, please consider that. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do sort of a, a real quick recap of our premise here. First, what is practical theology? Practical theology, as opposed to systematic theology, or biblical theology, or dogmatic theology, or whatever other kind of theology, is the discipline that is concerned with understanding and applying religious beliefs and practices to our daily lives. You'll notice that practical and practices have the same root. So it means, what do you do with our Christian faith in terms of our lives? It seeks to find practical answers to the question, how do we apply our beliefs to our daily lives? <clears throat> Not just sitting around thinking about it, or even praying about it, but how do we, how does it make a difference in our lives, especially as how other people see it? Now, there are several subfields to, or disciplines, sub-disciplines to practical theology, including pastoral theology. How do you care for a body of people in very practical ways? Missions and evangelism, how do you do outreach to people? Very practical. Uh, church growth and church administration. Church growth is a very technical field. It's not just evangelism, but how do you organize yourself? How do you, how do you create an environment that both uh, attracts people, encourages growth, etc.? Spiritual direction, which is practiced more in the Catholic and Anglican um, churches, but is also Protestant, which means to have a person of spiritual maturity who is providing direction for someone 
who is, uh, and, and to be a mentor for someone in a spiritual way. Um, it's a shame that we don't do more of that. Uh, we, we got into spiritual direction a little bit in our class on the spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith. If you didn't take that class, that's almost, it's not, not really a prerequisite, you don't have to take it first, but what we dealt with in that course is a very good sort of preliminary underpinning for what we're talking about here. Because it gives you the, the practical, um, how you, the discipline you can practice in your own life so that you then gain a level of maturity so that it becomes something that you can apply that others can see and benefit from. Then we get into theologies of justice, of peace, of liberation. There are, we also get into feminist theology, in uh, black theology, various other kinds of those. I mean, I'm not advocating anything here, I'm just telling you those disciplines exist as aspects of, um, of practical theology. In uh, liberation theology, particularly, is how does our Christian belief apply to people who are in an environment where they are the oppressed? And again, it, liberation theology is one of those theologies that has a reputation for being radically liberal and not particularly orthodox. In some cases that's true, in some cases it's not. But it is still a practical theology. Homiletics, which is preaching. How do you communicate the word? Um, spiritual formation and discipleship. How do we grow spiritually? And then especially how do we provide direction and guidance to others so that they can grow spiritually. Um, Christian formation and discipleship is a concentration, um, or a major, if you will, in most seminaries. You know, when you go to seminary, you get all the basic training, but then you can major in homiletics and communication, or you can major in Christian formation and discipleship, or counseling, or various other things. And so Christian formation and discipleship, particularly from a ministerial point of view, is seen as very important. One aspect of Christian formation and discipleship, we talked about this a little more specifically last week, is how do we act as good stewards of what God has put in our lives? So we talked about stewardship. Let's look at that again. Definition for stewardship is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. A steward is someone who takes care of something that is not theirs, but rather belongs to the master. We have examples in the New Testament. Jesus tells parables about the stewards. You know, the, the dishonest steward or you know, the, the, the three who were given talents when the master goes away and then he comes back to see what they did with them. Those are all stewardship issues where someone is called upon to care for something that it, they don't actually own, is owned by somebody else, but has been entrusted to them to care for. The, a perfect model of that, and when we say a steward is someone who cares for something that belongs to someone else, is the manager of a business. A manager who's not the owner. Somebody else is the owner, but you're responsible for making the business a success. You know, if it's a, if it's a retail business, you're the one that has to make sure the product is available and inventory is kept and that you, know, you're, you sell enough of it to make a decent profit and all that. So a, a business manager is a steward of somebody else's property. As Christians, we know that all things, and when we say all things, that includes us. That includes me, in my case. We know that all things are made by God and still belong to Him, and we are called to be stewards of everything that God places or entrusts into our lives. The first of the uh, chapters in your book is, of these 33 laws, is the law of rightful ownership, which basically makes the point that rightful ownership is that God owns everything. He made everything. He paid a price for everything in the redemption that came in Jesus Christ. You know, it's not just we who are saved, but rather that salvation eventually will be extended to all of creation. That's why we're told the lion will, at that on that day, lay down with the lamb. All of creation will be healed. And so God not only made everything, he then redeemed everything. That's creation and redemption, the two great pillars upon which the Christian faith is built, um, both of which were made possible through and by Jesus Christ. It was through the Word. John 1 says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. The Word is Jesus. So Jesus was responsible as the second person of the Godhead, responsible for creation, and clearly responsible for redemption. And so this creation and redemption is how God has demonstrated his rightful ownership of everything that is. 
And as I said last week, for those of us who are Christians, our question is, if once we recognize that all of this still belongs to God, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does God want us to do with his stuff? And his stuff doesn't just mean material possessions and money. It means me. What does God want me to do with me if I belong to him and that he has a rightful claim of ownership for me? Okay? Now, this stewardship obligation that we have, it is an obligation a command that we be stewards of what we've been given, but it's also a privilege. Because since God made us, and he made us uniquely as we are, the only way human beings ever find fulfillment is that we seek to live out our lives, to be stewards of what God has entrusted to us, including our lives and our abilities and our talents and our preferences, everything else, that we choose to live that out consistent with how God has designed us and how and what God desires for us. It is not too big a thing to say that no joy in our lives as Christians can be greater than when we are fulfilling the thing that God designed us for and we are being and doing what he intended us to be and do. That's where fulfillment comes from. Using the, his gifts the way he intended so that his will is worked out in our lives. That is where fulfillment comes from. That's why the subtitle of this class is, um, you know, finding a life that's really fulfilling or whatever that is. You know, it's a, I don't remember the exact words. Somebody's got it there. Um, what is it? Living a fulfilling Christian life. Living a fulfilling Christian life. Because when we are, are uh, right stewards of all that God has entrusted to us, then we will find ourselves fulfilled. All of the things that the secular world, see this is con completely contrary to what our secular Western society tells us. They tell us we'll find fulfillment by having a bigger house, or more cars, or a boat, or you know, a stereo system that can blow the windows out a block away, or whatever it is. And yet, if we're paying attention, we all have had the experience of really wanting something desperately, getting it, and finding out we don't even want to use it anymore. Okay. There is not anything inherently wrong with material possessions. Do not misunderstand me. God gives us things for our enjoyment. But that is not where we're going to find our fulfillment. If we think we're going to find our fulfillment in things, we are always going to be frustrated. And, and yet our Western society tells us that's, what, you know, that's where we ought to be going. Um, when Mark Hatfield was senator in Oregon, I heard him speak once and he read a letter um, people were really pushing them for tax uh, cuts. And he read a letter from a woman who said, you know, Senator Hatfield, you have got to help us. We, we can't bear this anymore. We are dying here. By the time we pay our taxes on our house and our cabin in the mountains and our three cars and our motor home and our boat, there's nothing left. <laughs> That's a perfect example of the fact that we are completely turned upside <clears throat> down in terms of thinking what is important. And then thinking that the government has an obligation to bail us out when we have gotten ourselves into that sort of situation. And yet, my bet is those things aren't really bringing fulfillment. They're just occupying time. I, I've told that story before, and I've told the story before too. When I was a college student, my brother's roommate, when I was a freshman, he had a stereo for sale. And it was like the coolest stereo in the world. First stereo I ever had an opportunity to own where the speakers were separate from the, you know, the, everything I had was pretty much close and play before that. Um, and so I paid him what I had and agreed to pay him money over several months to get this stereo. And I thought to myself, I really thought to myself, if I get this stereo, I am never going to want another piece of electronic equipment as long as I live. This will satisfy every need. I didn't even have the speakers hooked up before I was buying stereo magazines and thinking about what I was going to get next. Is that not the human way? Because we have been convinced that fulfillment comes from things. When in fact, fulfillment comes in being obedient to God's plan for our life, which means being good steward of all that God has entrusted to us. Now, we have the choice. God never forces anybody to do anything. We have the choice to go our own way, to try to find our own way. We, we can try to do what we think is going to make us happy that is not in God's will. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, you will not find fulfillment in that. And not only that, but you will not, you'll find that the fruit that you have in your life is, is bitter fruit. It is not what you want or what God wants. You will find frustration for living in vain. 
because you're shooting at the wrong targets. It doesn't help you to hit the center of the target if you're shooting at the wrong target. And the right target is to be a good steward of what God has called us to be and to do, to make right use of what He has entrusted to us. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Christian stewardship, and this is a critical point, it's not just about the money. Christian stewardship has to do with every aspect of our lives and every choice that we make about everything in our lives. Jesus calls us to be his disciples, and as disciples of Christ, we must have a clear understanding that he is actually calling us to whole life stewardship, which means that as our most fundamental act of obedience, we need to use our time, our talents, our treasures, everything in our lives in service to him. There we find fulfillment. And again, it's not just about whether we tithe or if we care for the planet, if we take care of the things that are entrusted to us, although it is about that too. Lynn? Did you hear the uh, doctor who was being released from hospital, the doctor with um, Ebola? He gave a great personal testament. Who's this? Uh, the Brady. doctor who. Dr. Brady. Brady. Okay. Yeah. Um, gave a great personal testament to his faith but also to this sense of fulfillment. Okay. It, it was just a wonderful... And I'm sorry, I don't know who Dr. Brady is. He's the guy that went in from, uh, from uh, Liberia into the hospital. Oh, the, at, at the Ebola. The Ebola. The Ebola. Ebola. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and he gave a really outstanding speech. Good. <laughs> it was <laughs> excellent. Good. On public news, can you believe it? The news Good. Did something. <laughs> they didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> Good. That's great. So when we talk about whole life stewardship, it's also important for us to recognize, and very few Christians do, unfortunately, that we're not just talking about the religious aspects of our lives. We're not just talking about showing up for an hour on Sunday morning, you know, maybe at church, maybe being part of a small group, uh, and then the rest of your life you just do whatever you want with whatever you have. Okay? We're talking about everything in our lives. This is radical stuff. Um, I can, there was a student in one of the classes here who came to me at one point and said, I'm, I'm really not used to this and I'm really uncomfortable because I've grown up my whole life in the church and I thought church is right here. And now I've started attending this church and coming to these classes and you're saying we have to think and we have to work and we have to, you know, we have to be involved and we, you know, that it's not just... You know, you come and spend an hour here and an hour there, and then you're done. We're talking about every part of our lives. And if you're not ready for that, then you're not ready to be a disciple of Jesus, not a mature one anyway. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. God has called every one of us to be his child, or else we wouldn't be here. So let's talk about stewardship of God's call in our lives. So we've gone from the general to, we don't want to be more specific. Yes? Can I have the last half of that last paragraph? Okay. This Disciples of Christ must have a clear understanding of the biblical call the whole life stu uh, stewardship as our most fundamental act of obedience. That's, you know, it has been said, wisely said, God really only wants one thing from us, and that's everything. It's as simple as that. He made us, he paid a price for us. We are His. He has a rightful demand on us. And so our job is to be good stewards with all that He has made us to be and all that He has entrusted to us. It's no less than that. And you can bury your head in the sand if, in the sand if you want to, but there, you know, there really is only one game in town. Um, okay, we good? So stewardship of God's call on our lives is where we want to start with some of the specifics. First, we do need to recognize that God has called every one of us. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, God has called you. If God had not called you, you would not be a Christian. Duh. <laughs> um, Ephesians 1.4 said, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. I'm not going to get into the election thing right now, although that's one of the strong verses about election. Uh, he chose us before the creation of the world. He prepared to call us. Okay? So then what are we going to do with God's call to us to be saved? Well, the first thing we need to do is answer it. Accept it. Again, God does not force. 
And again, strict election folks would say that, yeah, you don't have any choice. It's irresistible grace. Um, but God calls us, and the first thing we can do is accept it willingly and readily. Okay? So, stewardship of our call first means to fully accept our election to salvation without equivocating or going halfway. Like saying, well, I'll give you a couple hours a week, God, but the rest of it's my time. All right? I'll give you 10%, but don't expect any more than that. 10% of my time, 10% of my talent, 10% of my treasure. That's not the way it works. Because God calls us not, first he calls us to be saved, but then when he calls us, if we are going to be mature dis disciples, we can't go halfway. God calls us to be all in. You know the expression all in? Any poker players in the group? Um, when you play poker, and this is especially popular in, in Texas Hold'em, I'm not advocating poker, although I don't see anything wrong with it as long as you don't, you know. Gambling, gambling is a problem because it means you're trying to get something without, without paying the price for it. Okay? You want to get something for nothing. Uh, so I don't recommend gambling. But uh, Texas Hold'em Poker especially has gotten very popular. It's on television. They have celebrity poker and all that. Well, most of it is kind of boring until, and this happens often in Texas Hold'em, that's why it's so, it's so popular, somebody says, okay, I'm all in. And they push all of their chips to the middle of the table. When you say you're all in, it means I'm committing everything I have. I'm not holding anything back. All of my resources, all of my chips, are in the middle of the table, I'm either going to win it all, or I'm going to lose it all. That is a beautiful illustration for what it means to surrender our life to God. God doesn't want us to bet one chip at a time in our Christian life. God wants us to go all in. That we are betting on Him. We either win it all or we lose it all. And our faith is that we are not going to lose anything. Ultimately. We may lose the superficial stuff that the world treasures, but ultimately, we will not lose anything. Our faith tells us that if we approach our life for God with no limits, holding nothing back, that we go all in, then God will be pleased with us and we will learn what it means to be truly a mature disciple of Christ, a real steward of God's resources for us. Okay? A couple of verses. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Peter, and this is the, great, the, the first great sermon that Peter gives, that causes 3,000 people in Jerusalem to convert to belief in Jesus. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. We are called to salvation. That's the first part of this. And the second part, Romans 12, 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, that is your true and proper worship. 12, Romans 12, 1 is Paul's way of saying we are called to go all in. A living sacrifice. That everything I am and everything I have is to be put on the altar for God to use as he will. As one famous Bible teacher said, but we spend most of our effort trying to crawl off the altar. <laughs> and yet God calls us, there's no halfway with God. Calls us to, to be a living sacrifice, everything to be put on the altar of God, to fully surrender our lives to God, and to God's call on us to become a living sacrifice, a whole life steward, that everything is focused on Him. That's what whole life stewardship means, going all in. Okay, does that make sense? We good with that? So that's the first part of it, is to accept the call for salvation and then to recognize that means everything. There, there are no halfway Christians. If somebody's trying to go halfway, either they're not really a Christian, or they are not going to be, God is not going to be pleased with that, and they are going to find themselves dissatisfied with the Christian life. People who get dissatisfied with the Christian life, it's not God's fault. It's our unwillingness to give all that we must give in order to be both of service to God and fulfilled in that walk. Okay? So continuing this idea of stewardship of God's call, we need to recognize that our call is not just to salvation, it's not just to a full commitment, but it's also a call to a life of holiness before God. And then, a life of service to other people. We can't be... 
um, unholy Christians and fulfill God's will, nor can we be solitary Christians who don't care about the needs of anybody else. And if you don't really believe that, let me give you some verses. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Simple as that. We are called to holiness, which means to be more like Jesus. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, Ephesians 4.1. 2 Timothy 1.9, He has called us, He has saved us, and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. It's His purpose. It's His grace that we are committed to. He saved us by His grace, not by any act of our own. Ephesians says, you know, by grace we are saved through faith. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He saved us, and then He calls us to serve His purposes. Because He has a right to. Nobody else does, but He does. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. To live a holy life and to be of service. And 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, and this is kind of a transition to what, what we're getting into next. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards, there it is, of God's grace in its various forms. There's no money in this passage. We are to be uh, faithful stewards of the gifts God has given us, which is everything. Now, this all is completely contrary to what our Western culture tries to teach us. Our Western secular culture that tells us the goal is two houses and four cars and a motorhome and an RV, a uh, motorhome RV and a boat. You know, my wife and I actually have a lot of that. We don't have four cars, we don't have a boat, we do have a motorhome. Uh, just wish it was running. <laughs> but again, the issue isn't that God doesn't want you to have anything. Now, He does call some people to life of poverty because He's got plans for them that are different than that. But God gives us the things in our lives for our enjoyment and to share with others who have need. The question is, where's our heart in all of that? Do we see these as things God has entrusted to us to serve Him with? Our model in all of that is Jesus, who did not consider even His divinity something to be grasped onto, the great kenosis passage in Philippians, but rather set it aside, becoming like us, suffering on our behalf, for our benefit. And so in a very real way, to be a, a good whole life steward of what God has entrusted to us, is to be like Jesus. And to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? But there's a problem with that. You know the, you know the WWJD, uh, what would Jesus do? I like the principle behind that, but there's a problem with it. And Dallas Willard, in one of his books, talks about that when, when God calls us to be like Jesus, he doesn't mean that we just be ourselves up to a point where we have to make a critical choice, and then we decide, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Because at that point, we're not equipped to make the right choice any more than if we don't do any training and God... You know, and, and we go out one day and say, I'm going to run a four-minute mile, but I haven't trained for it. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to high jump 7.2 feet. We haven't trained for it. Jesus spent a life in relationship with God the Father, in prayer, and in discipline, and in fasting, and prepared himself spiritually so that in the great trials of his life, and you can say, well, yeah, he was the Son of God. Well, other great saints of the church have done the same thing. As they have modeled their life after Jesus in preparation for those great decisions, then they got to that point and they truly could understand what Jesus would do and, and follow it. But don't expect to just, you know, play it loose and fast until you get to that point and then be prepared to be as Jesus would have been. We have to model our whole lives after Jesus. And that's why the spiritual disciplines, our, our earlier class on the, the spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith, are the disciplines that Jesus modeled for us. And so I recommend that to you. But God calls us to a life of holiness. And, and in the midst of that holiness, part of it, he then calls us to, is to serve others with it. Any questions about that? Oh, well, yes. This, if you, you may not want to answer this because it's not exactly the topic. That's all right. But how do you define living a holy life? Like, a lot of the verse talks about mm -hmm. your holy life. And, and, and like, how do you define it? Well, I think um, the simplest definition is to be like Jesus. And to become more holy means to be more like Jesus. He is our model. 
and it is to focus our lives, as Jesus did, on his service to the Father. In other words, not what do I want, but what does he want? If, if we ask ourselves that question, we answer it in the right way, we will become more holy. What is it that God desires of us? That's the whole point of this whole life stewardship. Everything I am, everything I have is God's. How may I use it in his service and to his honor? You ask yourself those questions and answer them honestly in a, in a way that's honoring to God, you will be, you will be holy. It's as simple as that. Okay? I think Max Lucado, in one of his books, he opened up, you know, just take your life and imagine giving your will the day off today and putting Jesus' will in, in place, but living inside of your life. Mm -hmm. And number one, how would, your, how would your life then be different that day in every aspect? Right. Yeah, and, and don't just do it for a day. I mean, right. I, I'm sure Max Lucado is saying, give it, give it a try. You know, this is a test period, whatever. You know about the book, A Year of Living Biblically? There's a fellow who was Jewish who said he was going to spend one year, and to the extent he could within the law, I mean, you know, like he couldn't stone somebody for blaspheming or whatever, as much as he could within the law, he was going to try to follow every directive in Scripture, and then he wrote a book about it. But he had a very sort of liberal Jewish kind of interpretation of what the Bible said, so it was a fascinating experiment. I trust Max Lugano's direction more than that, so, okay. Um, so that's what it means to be holy, and that's, that's basically a synonym for what we're talking about, a whole life stewardship, taking everything we are and everything we have and seeking to use it in service to God since he owns it anyway. All right, so let's talk about the next aspect of God's call in our life, and that is to recognize and use the gifts, the energy, and the power that God has given us to fulfill his call and to uh, and purpose for us and for our lives. Now, we often talk about in the church about gifts. We don't often talk about energy and power, but the very energy we have to get up in the morning is a gift of God. I mean, the life itself is obviously a gift of God, and the power is something that God gives us. Every one of us, well, let me start with the power thing, just sort of, uh, Ephesians 1, 18 to 19 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You notice how often this talks about call. The hope to which he has called you, and also stewardship, to be stewards of. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable, incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, you can interpret that verse in two ways. One is that we are witnesses to the incomparable power he has by which he saves us. But it, I believe it's a legitimate interpretation of that when he says, and his incomparable great power for us who believe is that we, as we are followers of Jesus Christ, that God gives us access to that power. And it is a power that we, in the West, in the 21st century, almost never claim anymore. I was reading in, in uh, Thessalonians this morning, in my personal devotional time, and Paul is talking about to the Thessalonians, and he says, you know, and, and we bear witness that, that when we spoke to you, we spoke... You know, the Word of God, as attested to by the power that was demonstrated. Power of healing, miraculous power. We don't think that way anymore. And one of the reasons I think that Christians are pretty lame in our witness to the world is that we no longer understand that we have access to power. That as we are obedient to God and working in His service, not in order to, to show how great we are or to, you know, watch while I nuke these guys, or whatever. Um, you know, hold my beer and watch this, kind of thing. That's not, that's not a Christian approach. But God, there is power that is available to us. Part, that's part of the call. We are called to be His representatives on this earth, and so there is power there. But part of that power is the power of, of the united body of Christ. Now, I want to talk for a second about the miracle, and this has to do with God's call on our life and His gifting, because when God calls, He gifts. Everyone who is called of God, who is saved, is given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives every Christian one or more miraculously manifested gifts. Now, it may not look like a miraculously manifested gift if your gift is the gift of hospitality or the gift of service or whatever, um, but it is. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 8. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. 
There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, which means everyone, every Christian, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. When we talk about being good stewards of God's call on your life, included in His call is a giftedness. And so, um, quite often, that giftedness is demonstrated in what are you good at. Now, if you're good at you know, picking pockets or, or cheating on something on taxes, <laughs> then no. There may be some skill behind that that God wants you to use, but doing that thing is not honoring to God. But if you, whatever skill or talent or gift you have is an indication of how God made you, and it may very well be that that is a demonstration of God's gifting to you. In my own case, they say that, that the greatest fear that Americans have is, you know what it is? It's not snakes or spiders speaking in public. That is the greatest fear. A vast majority of people in the United States would almost rather be poked in the eye with a sharp stick than have to get up and speak in public. Well, I'm an introvert. Very few of you know me well enough to know that. But, like, I get on an airplane, the last thing in the world I want is for the person in the seat next to me to strike up a conversation. I'm very uncomfortable. The conference I just went to in England, I was a wallflower at all the receptions. I'm not comfortable with that sort of thing. Okay? But the, one, but the thing that God has made me is not afraid to speak in public. The idea of being, and I know it's true, but the idea of being afraid of speaking is completely foreign to me. I just don't get that. And that's how God made me. Well, a reflection of that is that he has, the gifts he's given me are the gifts of preaching and teaching. And the same thing is likely true for you. Um, if you, if you, set a beautiful table, and you're a good cook, and you enjoy having people in your home, that's probably a pretty good indication, if you're a Christian, that you may have the gift of hospitality, for instance. If you're one of the people who finds satisfaction in mowing a lawn or washing dishes, and some people do, don't ask me, <laughs> then you may have the gift of helps, or a gift of service, as it's sometimes called. Or, 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 I could go on. You get the idea. Identifying what you do well and what you take pleasure or find enjoyment in is often a key to figuring out what God has gifted you as, how the Holy Spirit has gifted and prepared you. Okay? Um, and the thing that we can do in terms of being good stewards of that call is figure that out. Have you ever sat down and thought about what has God, what has God made me good at, what has God given me pleasure when I do it, and how might that be a sign of God's gifting to me? Good stewardship means to be intentional about these things, all right? To think about how God has gifted you, and then to do something about it. For instance, you might try writing it down. I think, I think God has given me the ability to speak in public, or to, again, any of those other things. To write it down, and then prayerfully say, Lord, how can I use this more? To your glory, and to the benefit of your people. That's what it means to be a good steward. You have to use that gift, or you're not being a good steward of it. God's call and His preparation on you, for you. Now, the fact is, God has created all of us differently and uniquely. They've not gifted me and you in the same ways. It's possible we have overlapping gifts. But the point is, when it says, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, there is, and this is what I mean by the miracle of complementary gifting, right about that, when we look at the body of Christ in any given, given locale, a church, a community, whatever it is, God the Holy Spirit will provide everything that body needs to grow and to be healthy and to mature. The gift I have and the gift you have and the gift you have and the gift that somebody who's not in our class has, who's part of a body, those things will fit together to provide all that's needed. Sometimes it's hard for us to get somebody to do a very critically needed job in the church, for instance, because not everybody is willing to say, I have a gift, or God has gifted me in such a way, or I want to use this. You know, it, it, my preference, I'm an introvert, my preference would be to stay home and study and watch old movies and, you know, and grow the garden. The idea of spending my time, you know, 10 hours a week teaching classes and, and that sort of thing, that's not really what my personal preference is. 
But I can't deny the fact, and, and so people just people will say, no, I don't want to do that. And yet, I can't deny the fact that God has called me to do certain things, and so I have to do them if I'm going to be a good steward of that. And it's not just to do things for profit. I don't get paid for this, okay? But things that bring us, and I get great joy from it. I'm not saying I hate this. I love this. But my natural tendency may not be to be here. But God has gifted me and called me to it. And when I do it, he blesses me. And the same thing is true for all of us. If we will use, if all of us will, will prayerfully consider how has God gifted us, and how can we use that for the service of the body, then every need in the body will be met. God leaves nothing out. God does not leave any gaps in the body of Christ. Now, we have the freedom to disobey God and not provide the gifted service that we could, and in that way there may be a gap, a, a gap in the body. But if all of us are being good stewards of God's call and His giftedness as part of that call, then all of the needs will be met. There will always be somebody to provide the things that are needed in the body of Christ. Is that fair? Make sense? So whether you're a pastor or a plumber, if you are doing it to the glory of God, then His will will be done and the people of Christ will be served. Not just the people of Christ, but the people. Because we can be a service to the larger community as well. Okay? Part of being a steward of God's call and the giftedness that's part of that call. Next, I would say that if God's objectives uh, for His call on our life become our objectives, our lives will be both productive and fulfilling in ways we can't imagine. I talked about that earlier. You want to find fulfillment in your life? Identify God's call and His giftedness in your life, what He is calling you to do. Practice that, and you will find yourself fulfilled. I'm going to quote a great man who told this to me recently. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. <laughs> That's from Gene. I, I don't know, Gene, if you came up with that or if you got it from somewhere else, but I love it. Okay. All right? Uh, God gave it to Gene. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And if you are fulfilling that purpose in God's will as a steward of what he has called you to, then you will find fulfillment. Okay, thank you for that, Gene. <laughs> um, we cannot imagine the joy and fulfillment that we will find in being obedient to God's call. Okay. And when we're all obedient to God's call in our life, and we have a... We have a totality in terms of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst, that's when God really builds His church. And that's when that church then becomes the platform from which more effective witness happens. When we've, got, when we've got holes in our line, gaps in our line, then we're less likely to win the battle. Like any military. But when everybody recognizes God's call, His giftedness in their lives, and they step up and fill their place on the line, then the army of God is ready. So what are you called to do? What is your giftedness? What has God made you good at? What has God uh, made you what does God make you fulfilled by? And how does that reflect how God made you and gifted you that you can be of service to the body? That's the question we have to ask. That is a fundamental step in being good stewards of God's call, is identifying that. What has God called me to do? And if that's not immediate to me, immediately to me, what has God, how has God made me? What has He made me good at? What has He made me fulfilled by? And how does that apply to how I can serve the body of Christ? And it may be something wacky, you know. Well, I I love to do interior decorating. Well, we got a new church we can use your help with. Okay? There is always some way in which your giftedness can serve the body of Christ if you're willing to do that. Okay? Questions or comments about that? About the call aspect? Ken? We had a, I was in a church one time, we had a lady that we said that she had to get the parties. Yeah. And she could throw a fantastic party for the church. That every people came and loved them and enjoyed them. Yeah. And it was a gift. Well, that's the gift of hospitality, I think. Yeah. You yeah. know, to use the word the Bible uses. But I mean, hers was just out and out partying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, partying is just hospitality with some energy behind it. Yeah. As far as I can tell. You know. Um, so, any anything else? Any other comments or questions? Bob, you're holding your head. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? 
<laughs> you weren't here last week for my comment about German philosophers, but we'll catch you up. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and take a break now. Okay, the, the next aspect of our Christian lives I want us to talk about may, may seem a little different to you. Um, but it is the stewardship of, of God's gift of vision. There's a passage in Proverbs 29, verse 18, that says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's translated a lot of different ways in different, terrific, different versions. Uh, some people say where there is no understanding of, God, of God's law, the people perish, etc. But I believe there's validity, the idea that where there is no vision, the people perish, in terms of our vision of what God is calling us to do. So let's talk about vision for a few minutes, and then how we are to be stewards of that vision. First, spiritual vision, which is what we're talking about. We're not talking about you know, 2020 vision that you, you get checked at the optometrist. Spiritual vision is a gift from God. And the definition for it is it's the ability to see something that does not yet exist in the physical realm. Particularly to see how God's will might be worked out in a way that is honoring to Him or to the benefit of the body of Christ or to the larger community. Now, vision, this kind of spiritual vision, is especially given to leaders, people who have, uh, who have been called to provide leadership in particular ways. But it's not just given to leaders. In fact, I would go so far as to say God does not give any of us as Christians tasks without also giving us the vision to see how that task can be fulfilled. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not called to only deal with the thing that's right in front of our nose right this second. Obviously, there is some sense in which there is something greater, future, whatever, that God is calling each of us to be. And our ability to perceive that is what vision is all about. It is vision that allows us to move ahead with confidence to the completion of God's will, whether that be a huge project, which a Christian leader is given, or it might simply be whatever task you have been given and gifted for within the body. So God does give vision to allow us to see what needs to be done and how we are to do it, whether that is a grand vision or a more modest vision. All of us get that. And once God has given us a spiritual vision, it's up to us to steward that vision or be good stewards of it with wisdom, with care, with diligence. We have an obligation to see that vision come to fruition or else God would not have given us that vision. Now, this kind of idea is so common in, I would say, the secular world, although Christians as well. If you've ever been to a guidance counselor or a vocational counselor, talking, and they'll ask you questions like, well, where do you see yourself being, yourself being in five years or ten years? The world has changed so much, the idea of knowing, having any idea what's going to be in ten years is kind of ridiculous anymore. In fact, it used to be, because I was involved in management for many years, it used to be that we would develop five-year and ten-year plans. Well, nobody's got any sense in, in business anymore develops more than three-year plans, because in three years we could all be breathing through tubes. It's, you know, the world changes so fast now. But the fact is, the idea of thinking into the future, of dreaming about what could be, and how we feel we fit into that, is such a standard question, again, in vocational guidance counseling. And in fact, should be part of our Christian walk as well, because vision, spiritual visions, the vision for what God can accomplish and is calling us to accomplish, often that starts as a dream. I have a dream. Dr. King said. A dream of a time when children are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, the whole civil rights movement was built on that dream, and I believe that was of God. Okay. So, vision is a dream that's got some meat on it, that we see as being honoring to God. Now, the question is, do we have a vision to be more what God wants us to be? Do we have a vision for accomplishing more than is being accomplished today? Or are we just going to float along? No. After that, I'm going to show up a couple hours a week. And other than that, I've got my soaps. Or whatever else it is. You know, my telenovelas. That's not what we're called to do and be. If we don't have a vision for what God is calling us to be and do as part of the body of Christ, if we don't have a vision, then we don't have any focus. Because vision focuses us. 
It allows us to see where we can be and what we can do in a way that allows us to focus our efforts to get there. And that's the, the same, that same comment would be made by anybody that's telling you how to be more effective in business. Yes? Can you help me here with which came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, do, do we assess our abilities and then see where those will lead us, or do we look for a goal and then seek to get there? I think that, that when we talk about um, being stewards of our call, what has God gifted us at? What has God called us to be other than followers of His? That's sort of a start. But once we've identified what our gifts are, what we've identified, what God is calling us you know, to, to do and what He's prepared us to do, then we need to say, well, where is He going to take me with that? Okay. That's the vision. Yeah. Okay. Where, where might I go with this? Now, it, some, often that vision may be our own, or it may be that God's calling you to join a vision. We're building a new church. <laughs> okay? That takes vision and giftedness the, the way God has prepared people of many different kinds in order to make that work. And the, the, we have our congregation, we have about 120 people in our English language congregation, in the Muscle Minnow Spanish language congregation. Well, who would have ever dreamed, apart from the miraculous preparation of God, that within our body we had a guy who designs these buildings? So that all, you, you've seen the model up here, all of the design work. Full-blown plans, everything. We had somebody in our body to do that. We have a structural engineer who builds buildings. He built the Coors plant in Colorado. Um, and understands all of the technical aspects of wind shear and you know earthquake preparedness and, and is designed all of that. The number, we have one guy in our congregation whose whole job has been, just retired from, has been preparing the technical details for, for business, business buildings which means all the computer lines, all the you know, server rooms, all the telephone you know, connectivity. These are people that are in our congregation. And I defy anybody to tell me God did not gift them and place them here. And then when we start talking about this church, they felt a vision or felt, felt called to join the vision for us to, to create this new building. Any one of them could stay at home you know, play golf three times a week and forgotten about this, but they've committed their energies to make this work because God had them join the vision we have for that church with all the capabilities that they have. Right? So God may give you a vision for what you are called to do, or He may give you, you know, He may call you to join with a vision that is that exists as part of the body. All right? Um, we were just talking about this out here. Those of you who don't know, you know, we are building church that's going to end up being 18 to 20,000 square feet when we're done. We're building with no debt um, from a church our size, and that's a huge vision. And it's not just a vision for, wow, we're going to have a nice church to worship in, but it's a vision for what we can do in terms of attracting people to the, to the evangelistic and discipleship ministry of the church, but also there are aspects of it specifically dedicated to the service to the local community. And so we have a vision for that being a, a central point for service. That's a huge vision for us, for a church our size. And yet it's working. We're going to have our first service in there Christmas. We will be in the sanctuary for a first service and we'll launch the whole building in April, on April 5th, Easter. So plan, put it on your calendar. Okay? Um, and we believe that vision is from God. Now, it would have been very easy for us you know, when, I, when I started here at our church, we had about 20 people coming here on Sundays. This is five years ago. And, and we were sort of, it was fine, you know, fellowship, everybody felt good about it. You know, we had somebody coming in to preach on Sundays. Well, I told the folks when I started, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do this if you guys only want to stay 20 people. And I actually had a couple people come to me and say, we like it like this. I went, no, God calls us to grow the body of Christ. And we will grow. And so, not just I, but others captured a vision for what God could have our church be. And a lot of that we've already, you know, we're doing. And we will do more. Not because we want to be known as the best church or biggest church or anything else. Because we want to be of service. We have a vision for what we can be in service to God in this community. And in a larger community than just right here. Um, that vision made no sense when we had 20 people in this church.
Now that we have 200 people in this church, it makes a lot more sense. Now that we're two congregations, and we're seeing God's blessing in that. You know, none of us, no matter how big a vision, and I absolutely you know, believe and have been an advocate for this new building, <coughs> but even I have had times when I went, man, that's going to cost me. Where is that coming from now? We haven't slowed down once. Okay. When we have a vision that we believe is a godly vision and we commit it to Him, He provides the resources. I've, I've told the story of my friend Debbie, uh, Debbie, uh, Debbie Funk. Yeah. Almost, we had five Debbies as counselors, at, junior counselors at the Bible Camp where I was. Did I tell us in this class about the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills? I told it in the Bible, Bible class. Yeah. Um, Last week of Bible camp, I was a junior counselor. I come out one day, and on the steps of the main lodge in the evening, um, my friend Debbie Funk sitting on the steps, and she's singing the song, The Lord Owns the Cattle on a Thousand Hills. And I said, what you doing, Dad? And she said, oh, I'm just thinking about the fact that the Lord truly does own the cattle on a thousand hills, and I've been accepted. She had graduated from, from high school that, that spring before, and she said, next week I'm supposed to leave to go to Moody Bible Institute for college. And I don't have any money for college. And I don't know what we're going to do. What I'm going to do. Except, she said, and she was a great guy. She said, I'm just thinking about the fact that the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills and I'm just waiting for him to sell some cows. <laughs> she had a vision for what God had called her to do. And she then had confidence that God would somehow provide, even though she was only a week away. Well, the next day, if I remember the next day, she got a letter from her church saying they had voted to provide for her entire college education. They were going to pay for it. The Lord sold some cows. So she had the vision. She had a commitment to that vision, and she counted on God to provide the resource for it. Doesn't mean she wasn't responsible. You know, she was working for the summer, whatever. But God provided for her. So the question we always have to ask is, are we just going to float along with our Christian faith, you know, and, and bless, you know, bless me, Lord, you know? Or are we going to have a vision for what God can do? Um, it reminds me, so many people these days, and you, you probably almost undoubtedly heard it, people will say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Heard that? What that really means, if you've ever thought about it, is I want all of the benefit, but I don't want to take, have to have, take any responsibility. In other words, I'm spiritual, I want all the blessings, but I don't want to have to be, I'm not religious, meaning I'm not willing to actually do anything to reflect any sort of faith commitment. Well, we can't have a vision and, and work to see that vision come to fruition in God's will unless we're willing to, you know, to do more than just want all the, all the benefits. We have to be willing to commit to it. To have a vision means to have a dream, to aim for that dream, to, to, to think in more particular terms of how that dream can be fulfilled, and then, in God's grace and as He provides, to work to see that vision come into reality. And it happens over a period of time. To believe, first, that God can make that vision. If it is honoring to Him, He will, to make that vision come to pass. Right? Now, Scripture is absolutely full of examples where God gave a vision to people. Quite often, it was a vision that we don't understand how that made any sense. Um, Noah, who the suggestion is made that Noah didn't even know what rain was. We, we don't even know if rain existed at that point. You know, the, the water was coming up from, from the ground, you know, the, the, the separation of the waters and everything else. Some scholars have said there's no indication that there was ever, that had ever been rain before. They got it provided water out of the way. So I'm not sure about that. But at any rate, Noah never had no reason to have any conception of the fact that it was going to rain and everything was going to flood. And yet, God spoke to him and told him this. And Noah had a vision of God's will being fulfilled in such a dramatic way that he spent a hundred years building a boat. He ridiculed the whole time. At least according to Bill Cosby's version of it, he was ridiculed. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture says that too. <laughs> so, you know, Noah had a vision of God's will being fulfilled, even in that case in a catastrophic way. Then Abraham, Abram, who later became Abraham, was called by God, and he had a vision of having, of being the father of a great people, even though he was too old to have kids, 
and of that people having a land of their own, the promised land. And he heard this from God, and he accepted that as a vision, and he followed God to see that vision come true. Moses, after being spoken to by God, and, and some of these guys, Noah and Moses, for instance, were reluctant. Moses especially. And yet, once they became convinced that, you know, God's will, they had a vision. Moses had a vision for the deliverance of God's people from the most powerful ruler in the history of the, in the world at that time. History of the world up at that time. The Pharaoh of that period. There are more modern characters. Uh, William Wilberforce. Do you know Wilberforce's name? If you don't, you, re you really need to read one of the really good biographies by William Wilberforce. Eric Metaxas has written a really good biography of William Wilber Wilberforce. It's hard to say. William, William Wilberforce. Wilberforce was, um, he was in the, he was in government in England and was kind of a frivolous, you know, ladies man and everything else. Who God called and saved. And Wilberforce committed himself. He felt God calling him to two things. One, to end slavery in the British Empire. And second, to correct the morals. At that time in history, England was a horrific, decadent empire. I mean, Drinking, prostitution, child labor, it was a horrendous place. You couldn't walk down the streets in London for fear that, you know, you'd be robbed in broad daylight. Wilberforce committed himself and spent the whole rest of his life, and just a few days before his death, the British Empire ended slavery. And it was primarily because of the efforts of William Wilberforce. And by the time of his death also, the morals of England, of all of the British Empire, had completely changed. That led us into the Victorian era, and whatever else we say about the Victorian era, era crudes and all that, it was a whole lot better than what it had been prior to Wilberforce's influence. Here was a man of God who had a vision for ch fundamentally changing the world in a way that he believed God was calling him to do. Ridding the world of slavery and bringing in a sense of morality that did not exist. And he did it because he loved Jesus. Okay. Other people who have had a, a vision, and they were stewards of that vision, of how God could lead them to great things. A man named David Janey, um, a book I recommend to you, which I, I would have probably included this as a text for this class, but um, couldn't get enough of them. You know, sometimes you, they don't have enough of them available. This is the stewardship of life. And in the first chapter of this, they talk about the vision that a man named David Janey had. They had, um, he he and others felt that God was calling them to have a large evangelistic campaign in the Philippines. This is several years ago. And so he gathered some people together, and they prayed about it and everything else, and Janie asked the other people involved, and they said, how many people do you think God can call together for an evangelistic campaign in the Philippines? And some people said, well, thousands. And some said, wow, tens of thousands. And they thought they were being bold. And David Janey said, how about a thousand thousand? A million people? Well, several years ago, I think it was in the late 80s, I have to look that data, um, a million people gathered in the largest square in Manila, the Philippines, for an evangelistic campaign. They actually had to have aerial photographs to, to prove there were a million people there, the largest number of people ever gathered. They had over 200,000 professions of faith. Churches in the, in the Philippines worked for years working through all that stuff. Because God had given one person, a pastor named David Janey, a vision for a million people hearing the saving message of Jesus Christ. And that was his vision. Now, others caught that vision and joined in it. But he was the one person that God had anointed with this vision and that he carried through, even when so many people he was close to saying, you know, I think that's maybe unrealistic. He going, no, it's not. This is God's call. This is God's plan. And he had a vision for what had not existed, but could exist in God's will. Now, there are a lot of other examples of visions. In fact, the Bible is full of visions, not always this kind of vision, but I want to give you one example, which I think is very, you know, very useful for us. It is the story of Elijah and the king of Aram. I'll give you a little background before this. What's happened here is that the nation of Israel is being raided by, by these sort of bandit groups under the endorsement of the king of Aram, which is Syria. 
and they're attacking and stealing from the uh, Israelites. But the thing is, they're not being very successful. Every time they want to have a raid, it's like the Israelites know they're coming. And the king of Aram um, is so upset about this. No matter what they do, it seems like Israel knows what's going to happen, and they cut them off. So we pick it up here in verse 10. Time and again, oh, and Elisha was the prophet. Elisha is speaking to the king of Israel at this time. Time and again, Elisha warned the king of the things that Aram was going to do, so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? He thought they had a mole, somebody who's telling their plans. None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. God was giving Elisha miraculous visions of what was about to happen, and he was telling the king of Israel so that they were ready for it. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha, uh, when his servant, got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I'm sure the prophet said, say what? Or the, the servant. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's where that expression comes from, the chariots of fire. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. 2 Kings 6. Now, several things about that. First, how does this story end up? The army is struck blind. They, they're, they're there wandering around, you know, in darkness, and Elisha says, this is not the road you want to be on, follow me. And they follow him, and he walks them right into the city of Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel. Okay, this is the kingdom of Israel in the north, kingdom of Judah in the south, where Jerusalem is the capital. He walks them right into the city of Samaria, which means they are now in the hands of the army of Israel and can be destroyed. In fact, one, one person says to Elisha, can I kill him now? Can I, can I, huh, huh, can I kill him now? And Elisha says, no, don't kill them. Give them something to eat and drink. And he gave, they gave the army of the king of Aram that had come to kill Elisha food and drink. And Elisha prays, and their blindness is taken away, and they are released to go home. And it just says, and there were no more raids from Aram against Israel. <laughs> he was a man of God, a righteous man. So that's one thing, is it's beautiful how this all gets worked out. And the, and the mercy, the power, remember earlier I said we don't recognize the power that God gives? The power that was given to Elisha, the mercy that he showed against the enemies of the people of God, but then here, this amazing vision that by Elisha's prayer is given to his servant, that the servant can see the angelic armies, that there are more who are with us, than those that are with them. So this is a miraculous kind of vision, and I think that it is only our lack of faith that keeps us from having more of this kind of vision. But even though God may not often give us these miraculous visions, God still does give vision to many of us, spiritual vision, that even though we may not be able to see the miraculous things around us, the armies of angels or the miraculous events somewhere else, since Elijah had a regular, you know, he regularly knew what was going to happen. God still gives us spiritual vision that we can see what can happen. Maybe not what has happened or what is happening, but what can happen in God's will. God still paints vision on our hearts if we are open to it, if we are open to letting God do so and are sensitive to what God, what vision God has given us. Now this, this kind of vision is not this miraculous kind of seeing of things so much as it is spiritual insight. We're talking about vision which is a spiritual sight that reveals to us what God's will can be that is consistent with His character. Well, after we get that revelation, our vision of what can be in God's will, 
After the revelation, we then have the responsibility to do something about it. God doesn't force us to do anything. The miracle is the God of the whole universe never forces us either to accept Him or to be obedient to Him. We always have that choice. But there are three points I would make about this in terms of God's giving, giving vision, that is spiritual insight for the, for the future of His will to us. First, we need that vision. In order to find our way on life's journey, to have assurance of God's provision and protection, God will tell us, this is what I want done. And then, like my friend Debbie Funk, then we can have the assurance that God will provide the means. Until we have a clear vision for what God's desire is, which He will give us if we'll let Him, then we will stumble in terms of having this faith that God will provide. But once we have a clear sense of what God desires, then it is much more readily ours to have faith that He will provide. Then secondly, we need vision to keep our focus on our God-given goals. See, God often, in fact, God almost always doesn't give us the whole picture. We may have a vision for what might be out there, but in terms of what the process is, it's very much, uh, I used the analogy in a sermon not too long ago, that we may know where we're going. God may have given us an image of that. But it's like climbing in your car at night to drive home, home being miles away. You know what home looks like. You have a very clear sense of that. But in terms of how you, what's going to happen between here and there, you only can see as far as your headlights. Well, that's how God deals with us. God will let us see as far as our headlights, but as, as, as we're willing to move forward as far as we can see, what happens with the headlights? See further. You see further. And then you see further, and you, see, you don't climb in your car and turn on the lights, and you can see everything between here and home. Although you have a clear sense of what home looks like, you know, well. So you can see only from here to the end of your lights, and then more, and then more, and then more, until you arrive home. That's how God deals with us. And yet, if we have that vision of getting home, or getting to whatever place it is God has given us a vision for, then we have the assurance that we can go as far as we can see right now, and then God will let us see more. And then God will let us see more. He, God very rarely tells us all of his will for how this is going to happen. We decided to build this church. I didn't know how it was all going to happen. I didn't know who was going to step forward with the skills. I didn't know where the money was going to come from. We go as far as the light we have for today. And then God gives us light for tomorrow. And for the next day. And for the next day. Because we have a vision that he has given us for what it's going to be when we're done. All right? It's also true that we need vision to set our hearts on the true reward that God promises. The key word there is true reward. We have to keep our eyes on the vision for God's ultimate goal for things, or else we are going to get distracted by all the little diversions along the way, especially in a culture that wants us to be distracted by those things, that wants us to get wrapped up in the little disputes, or the little attractions, or whatever else it is. When we have a vision which God is willing to give us if we're open to it. If we have a vision for where God wants us to go, and we are willing to go just as far as our headlights give us for today, knowing that there then will be more vision beyond that. My friend Debbie Funk did not know until a week before she was ready to go to the Blue Bible Institute where the money was coming from, but she kept moving forward because she counted on God because she knew what God had called her to. Then we can see amazing things happen. Okay? But the idea that we set our hearts on the, the true reward, the culmination of the vision, not the little side things. I have another story which is not as positive. A um, friend of mine, I will sometimes wonder what's going to happen when people watch these videotapes <laughs> I'm, I'm referring to. Um, I'm not going to use his name. But I had a friend who was a banker. He worked for Wells Fargo Bank in Seattle. And pretty high up. He had felt for many years God was calling him to the ministry. And he had friends at Regent College in Vancouver, BC, where he could go and get his Master of Divinity. People on faculty. Um, and yet, he was pretty high up in the banking industry. And they, they offered him a job. In fact, it was one of these things where we will move you to Texas and give you a great job, high paying job, or if you want, we'll let you retire now. I mean, he wasn't that old, but we'll, you know, we'll give you benefits and everything else and you can you'll do what you want. And he was really struggling with this. And we went to dinner one night.
night at a restaurant. And the restaurant we were in is actually it was actually in the um, Hyatt Hotel in downtown Seattle. And the restaurant, there was a lower level and then there was an upper level. And between the lower and upper level, there were these cafe curtains. So we couldn't see the people up above and they couldn't see us, right? We're sitting at a table right there. Have I told this story before? Anyway, we're sitting there and we're talking about this. And I said, well, have you thought about putting out a fleece? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, very biblical. Gideon did. You know, Gideon put out a fleece and said, Lord, if this is your will, then may there be dew on the fleece, but not on the ground tomorrow morning. Well, sure enough, there was dew on the fleece, not on the ground. I said, well, then Gideon said, then, okay, Lord, I just want to be sure, so I'll put the fleece out again. If there's dew on the ground, but not on the fleece tomorrow, then I'll know it's your will. That's what happened, and he moved forward. I said, put out a fleece. Say, whatever it is, God, if, if this happens, I will know this is your will. Because he was struggling with, do I go to school, seminary, or do I... Well, he said, well, I'm getting ready to go to a high school reunion, and none of my friends in high school knows that I became a Christian. And so my fleece would be that if anybody who doesn't know anything about me in recent years comes up to me and says, your life as a Christian is really an inspiration to me, I'll know that's God's will for me to go into seminary and go into ministry. And I said, okay, that sounds great. We prayed about it. As soon as we said amen, a woman walks up to our table from the cash register where she'd just been paying her bill. So she'd been up there when we agreed on this lease. She walks up and says, gentlemen, excuse me, you don't know me. I was sitting at the table right up above you that you couldn't see. And I just want to tell you what an inspiration it is to me to have two adult men talk about the Lord and the Lord's will for their lives. You have inspired me with your Christian commitment. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And she turned and walked away. Okay, I have goosebumps now. I have goosebumps every time I tell the story, and I swear to you this is the absolute truth. That was exactly what, now he thought it was going to be at his reunion, but that's not what he put out as the fleece. If anybody comes up to me who doesn't know me in recent years and tells me they're inspired by my Christian life and walk, I'll know that's a call to the ministry. And I said, I think you got your answer, buddy. He went to Texas and is working at the bank. What does it take? All right, well. He was a friend, he's a dear guy, I'm not picking on him, but I'm going, are we listening? Are we willing when God gives us the vision to follow up when he affirms these things to us? Not always. Vision from God should lead to action for God. If God gives us a vision, if God affirms that vision to us, we then have a responsibility to be good stewards of that vision. Right? Now, God does not leave us in the dark. Bertrand Russell, who's a, an atheist philosopher in England, somebody asked him once, said, if you were to die today and you go to heaven and you find out that Christianity is true, what would you say? And he would say, I would say, God, you didn't give us enough evidence. And that's silly. And it links back to Actually, that's a quote that's in our philosophy book at this time, if you've read that. But I've used that quote before. I used it in a sermon a few weeks ago. Um, God has given us so much information, so much direction, and he continues to do so. God especially speaks to us, confirming our vision, that, that is his will as reflected in our vision, in three primary ways. And we need to be aware of these ways, because we can actively seek affirmation of the vision God gives us as we seek to fulfill it. First, we receive confirmation of God's desire and our vision through the instruction and direction given in His Word, the Bible. And somebody in Bible study recently say, but how do I know God's will? And I don't even have one right here, but I picked up the Bible and said, well, this is a good place to start. God has not... Not this, this is okay, but it's the Bible. You know, the Word of God, Scripture, God has not left us without input. He has given us an extraordinary amount of information about his will and his desire and how you know, he's told us about himself, he's told us about us, and he's told us about he and we are supposed to be together and how that works. So the first way that we can confirm God's will and the vision that he has given us to make sure that it is God's vision, you know, God's desire that we're, we're seeing in our vision and not our own, you know, God's given me a vision for putting, you know, for doing who knows what. No, 
What does the Word of God say about that? So we, we look at the instruction and direction given in His Word, the Bible. Secondly, we get confirmation of God's will and His vision for us as we go and meet with Him in prayer. Now, the assumption in that is that you know what real prayer is. It doesn't just mean going to God and saying, here are the 12 things I want today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. It is a matter of conversing with God, of speaking to Him and listening to Him, of <coughs> praising Him, of confessing our sins to Him, of giving thanks for all He has done, of asking for the needs for others first and then for ourselves, and listening to Him. If we do that, God will speak to us as we practice that prayer. And the third way is He guides us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts. As I am seeking to be more like Jesus, as I am becoming more holy, as I am becoming closer to Him, then I will understand more what God's will is. I will also be called more to reading of Scripture and to listening to God's, God's voice to me in prayer. But I will have more wisdom about God's will. All, th all things work together for the good of them uh, who are called by God. Who All things work together for the good of those who... I just forgot that verse! Anyway, those who are called according to his purpose. Those who are called according to his purpose. There you go. Sorry. Just, just lost a synapse. One more. Gone. Um, the idea that if we are called according to his purpose, we we are seeking him, we are going closer to him, we are learning of God, then we will know more what his will is. People will say, I don't have any idea about the will of God. Well, have you talked to him? Have you gotten to know him? You've grown close to him? Do you have a sense of who he is? We have the opportunity to do all those things. And then we will know, in addition to what we find in the Word and what we hear from God daily in prayer, then we will have a sense of what is God's will. These are the great saints of the church that they knew because they had grown in the Lord what it is that's God's will for us. So I would go so far as to say the great blocker of vision great blocker of godly vision of what God desires for us and what is possible in Him is simply unbelief. Whether it's that we don't believe in Jesus, that's obviously a, a block. But even if we have accepted Jesus and are saved, we don't really believe that God is active in the world today, that His will is available to us, that we can accomplish great things for Him. That lack of faith is cataracts of the soul. They blind us. They blind us to the vision of God. We have to have some belief. You know, the, some of the people in our church are so enthusiastic about the new building that we have and all that's going to happen and all of it. And there are some folks who I still get regular kinds of just, eh, well, yet, yeah, but, you know, during prayer time, saying, Lord, please send a lot more people to our church because we're building that big church. And man, we're going to have to have a lot of people with it. And I'm thinking, really? You really don't think God is going to do that? God bless him. <laughs> bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. Yeah. Not saying anything you want about anybody as long as you say, well, bless their hearts. That's a southern thing. Just get as big as a, as a hat. Bless her heart. Um, but it's true. And, and, and I'm not upset about that. I don't, I'm not angry at those people. I don't judge them. And yet there's a sense in which we still have people, even people in leadership, that they, they, lack, they lack sufficient faith to fully capture all of the vision. They have some of it, but not all of it. They have, and their lack of faith in the, the whole thing is, you know, they have cataracts. They can see some, but they can't see everything, you know, clearly. Ken? I, I can remember when I was in my 20s, and I used to deliver newspapers, and I would get put the Bible in cassette tape and listen to whole books in the, at, a, at a time while you know, delivering newspapers. I could listen to the whole book of Exodus in one session of delivery, <laughs> you know? And what was amazing to me is how I transformed my faith by seeing God's ability to change things at an instant. Yep. And you see it over and over and over, but oftentimes when we read the Bible, we read little snippets and little snippets here and there, and when you see Him working over the course of a lifetime, like especially Joseph, I mean, everything changed for him just like this, more than once, yeah. <laughs> for the good and the bad, you know? Well, sometimes it took longer, like when he was in prison, when they told him right. they would speak for him, but he didn't. But yeah, you're right. In fact, in one of our previous classes on how to study the Bible, uh, I shared my dis the discipline I have that I recommend to people, and that is I study things, 
you know, and especially for me, because I'm preaching sermons and teaching classes and things like that, I have a regular process of study. But my personal devotion time in the mornings, I just mentioned I was reading Thessalonians, is I, I read. Just, I don't, I don't look, I don't read the footnotes. I don't, you know, part of my discipline is simply to read. And I'll read several books. You know, I read, you know, I think first, first, second, and third Thessalonians this morning. Because I don't say, okay, I'm going to do this for 10 minutes, or I'm going to read one chapter. I read, and, and I think about it, and I let it soak into me until I feel like, okay, that's enough for today. And, and when you do that every day, then you do get a much more comprehensive. And then, you know, I, when I'm done, when I get to the end of Revelation, I'll start in Genesis 1 again. And I'll read through the whole thing, Old Testament, New Testament. And you do need to have some time where you study it and think about what it means. And you look up the cross-references and you're, you know, you're reading the footnotes and you're really thinking about what God is telling you. But I believe there's times when we simply need to read the flow of God's Word and let it soak into us. And so that's, that's my recommendation. Now, for some people, that might not work as well. That's, that, for me, is very fulfilling. I think I get, I get more personally out of that than I do when I really work very hard with all the tools and everything to figure out what it means, you know, when I'm preparing a sermon. Um, so that's, you know, that's, I agree with you, but I feel that. So, one of the things you need to see here is that number one and number two are acts of intentionality. All right? Now, God will guide us through the indwelling of the Spirit in our minds and hearts, but that's God's act. Number one and number two, God will speak to us, but we have to take the initiative. God calls on us to go to His Word, the Bible, and say, what does this teach me? What in here will direct or confirm the vision that I believe God has given me. Is the vision I think God is giving me consistent with his word? If not, am I just getting part of it wrong or do I need to revisit that? When I pray to the Lord and ask for his, his direction, if I do that in a way that we built the relationship up, then he will speak to me. But I have to go to him in prayer and I have to spend the time developing the relationship. So to study and follow his word every day, to pray, you know, scripture says pray without ceasing, and to ask for spiritually open eyes, to see God's will and have a vision for what he desires, that he wants me to be part of, those are disciplines that I need to pursue that will allow me to be a better steward of the vision that God would give me, to either find it or to follow it in a way that is most honoring to him. Now, one of the things that we have to remember as we talk about these things is this is not the real world. Remember the Elijah story? The servant could only see the army of the Arameans and was frightened. But as Elijah was able to see and prayed that the servant then was able to see, there was a whole other world right alongside this one. You know, um, in the philosophy book that some of you have been reading this week, um, and it's an, it's an analogy that I've used before. They talk quite a bit about the movie The Matrix. You guys saw, saw The Matrix? Well, the movie The Matrix basically is the message that comes out in this is that everybody thinks they're living their lives and that this is reality, when in fact they're all hooked up with tubes someplace and this is just an implanted world. That it's not the real world. The real world is completely separate from that. And the whole theme of the Matrix is that some of these people are fighting against the machines that are holding them captive, but most people aren't because most people don't even recognize the fact that the world they think is real is not real. Ding, 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 ding. The world we think is real is real, but it's not as real as the world we can't see. The world that Elijah could see and that he prayed for his servants to see. There's a whole spiritual realm that we are blinded to. And so whenever we start thinking about the fulfilling of God's plan through the visions he gives us, we need to recognize that it is not by my might, it is not by my power, as Scripture says, that we're going to win through the vision that God gives. It is entirely by his spirit because those who are with us, if we are on his side, are greater than those who are with them. The world, that, the world that we can't see is more real and more powerful than the world that we can see. And part of having a vision for what can be is recognizing that all of those forces that look like they're going to keep you from fulfilling God's vision, if 
you, if that vision is honoring to God and you're seeking to fulfill it in honor to God, that the forces that would cause that vision to be real are stronger and greater than the forces you can see which might prevent that vision. God is on our side and we need to ask Him to assist us in fulfilling the vision He has given if it is, a, if it is His vision. And that's one of the questions we have to answer. Lynn? Yeah, uh, our text for tomorrow uh, reminds us of C.S. Lewis' story, The Last Battle, mm -hmm. where the children are talking about the real England and the right. England that they are looking at at that moment. Right. And they're, it's similar, but it's so much brighter and so much right. more real. And I think if we live in an uh, honest relationship with God, mm -hmm. um, as we walk this earth, we we do our prayers, but do we expect an answer? Boom, like that, like only because I just prayed, I want an answer while I'm in that prayer mode, God? You know? no. God doesn't work that way. And so in our everyday life, we're walking along the street, and we have uh, uh, moments and wonderful revelations, and the colors are brighter, and the gifts that are around us are more visible. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful experience that, you know, people say to me, life sure is different for you. But I said, yeah, it is. And it's, yeah. a, it's a great difference. Coming back from the C.S. Lewis conference I was at in England, I reread all seven of the Chronicles of Narnia. Starting in September, I'm going to be preaching from the Chronicles of Narnia. Now, I'll be preaching from Scripture, but I'll be using Scripture that, that you know, yeah, Lewis based the Chronicles <coughs> of Narnia, the themes and messages and everything on Scripture. And so I'll be reading sections of Narnia, but I'll also be taking the scripture that would have been the foundation for that. As I said before, uh, there is more wisdom and truth in those seven little children's books than in libraries full of stuff. Well, the other thing that I've done is I just finished reading the first of Lewis's um, space trilogy, which is called Out of the Silent Planet, and then Paralandra, starting Paralandra now, and then uh, the, the, he wrote science fiction too. Well, there's a scene in Out of the Silent Planet. They're on Malacandra, which is Mars. And the ruler of Malacandra is called, is called Oyarsa. Oyarsa is like an archangel. It's the sense you get, because there's, there is a different Oyarsa over other planets. But our planet, Vulcandra, it's called in the books, that is Earth, is called the Silent Planet, which is why the book is called Out of the Silent Planet, because the Oyarsa there went bad, or was bent. And so therefore, that planet is sealed off from influence or connection or communication with the rest of, the, of God's, God's universe. Well, the interesting thing is there are two characters, Weston and Divine. The good guy, there's three humans who've gone there. One of the good guys, whose name is Ransom, that tells you something about, I've read these books before, it tells you something about what's going to happen later. His name is Ransom. But the two bad guys, Weston and Divine, they're called, Weston is a scientist, and when they're having this gathering and the Oyarsa is there, and even Ransom has trouble fully seeing the Oyarsa, but he can tell he's there, he hears his voice clearly, he can see sort of the light shifting. And then there are these creatures called Elodins, who are angels. And at first he can't see them at all, and then he begins to be able to see them. Well, Oyarsa and the Elodils, Weston and Divine, a scientist and a sort of cynic, they can't see them at all. And so Weston is making a fool of himself by trying to convince there are three peoples, three groups of, of creatures there that are all called now, which means since he means. And they, they all get along with each other. They're all the way God meant them to be. Um, but Weston is trying to treat them like they're primitive savages and trying to convince them that, you know, to take beads from him, as though that's going to win him favor and all sorts of things. And there's one point in which he's dancing around trying to, trying to give them beads, and this noise comes from all three of the sentient sort of kind of creatures that are there, this loud noise. And Weston says, stop roaring at me. And Oyarsa says, I'm very sorry that they were not roaring at you. They were just laughing. So the humans who were so committed to the human way could not see the spiritual creatures. And they had a completely wrong idea about what the right values were. Um, great truth. So we have to understand that there is a world that has different values, that has beings we can't readily see, and that that is the realm that God gives us strength from if we're open to that. And so, earlier I said, 
you know, what, what has God called you to? What is the call of God on your life? Similarly, what vision has God given you? Once you recognize what gifts, how God has made you, what gifts he's given you, and how he wants you to use those, then what has he called you to do or to be? What great thing, and I use the word great, I use the term great thing, it may be a world-changing thing, like William Wilberforce, or David Janey, who had a vision for a million people and had over 200,000 conversions for Christ. It may be something like that, or it may be salvation for your next-door neighbor. That you have a vision for that. And that that next-door neighbor then will become the William Wilfred Force or the David Jane. You know, there are no small visions if those visions are God's vision. So what vision has God given to you? If you don't know what that is yet, then that's something for you to pray about. To seek God's word in questions about any of that or comments? Stewardship of God's call, which includes his giftedness. Stewardship of the vision that God would give us for what we can do for him and in his will. Questions or comments? Well, I think it's even interesting if you hear different people uh, in all different areas of life that are Christians and how even God worked in a, like Josh Hamilton, the baseball player. You know, he was incredibly talented, got into drugs, thought he would never play baseball again, got signed by the Reds five or six years after he had been out. And when he started, he got this vision of himself hitting home runs in an all star game. And he had, you know, rededicated his life to God. And, of course, played with the Reds, got traded, made the all-star team, and just killed everybody in the home run derby. But he had had a vision of that, and it was a special vision that he did. He's like, it, it wasn't just a, a, a dream, a, my own personal dream. It was something that God suddenly placed in front of me that I right. saw. Yeah, and I, and I will, let me give you one caution. Yeah. <laughs> if God gives you a vision calls you to it. That doesn't mean, and I said, you know, God will give you the steps along the way. He will let you see as far as the light gives you for now, and then more light, and then more light. It is quite likely, not only possible, but quite likely, that as you are seeking to follow God's vision, you know, God's will toward the vision He has given you, that you will encounter opposition, and that you will suffer for it. And yet God can redeem that too. This Dr. Brady. How many people do you think probably said, how is it possibly in God's will that he has contracted Ebola, a, a disease for which there is no cure, because he was over there serving and giving himself for the needs of people in service to God. How can that possibly be God's will? Well, I haven't heard it, but from what you say, it may very well be the testimony that he gave. It was exactly what God desired. And yet, the only way that that testimony had any impact, the only way anybody would have heard it, the only way anybody would have paid attention to it, is because here's a doctor who had gone over to care for Ebola patients and contracted this horrific disease himself. So sometimes, either because of opposition from the devil, or because God works in mysterious ways and we don't know what may be necessary for, for our witness and for the fulfillment of the vision God has given us or his call on us, we may not understand that, and it may be a hard thing, you know. Um, but recognizing that the hard things exist in the world we can see, and that there's a larger world than that, and that this is just a breath of what God's eternity is. All right. So it's a much bigger issue than that, and we can't always. But but Carolyn and I, when we were when I was headed to the CS Post conference and she was headed to the airport, we hired a guy, uh, Clifford. If you ever need a driver, although he's not cheap, a drive, nice Mercedes though. If you ever need a driver in London, I got somebody to recommend to you. He's a great guy, and he's telling us stories about Paul Newman and the, you know and other people he you know, drives around. Um, and he had driven around. Um, it wasn't Tom Cruise; it was somebody else who was part of Scientology. And he said, "What is up with Scientology?" Because he, he knew. I told him I was a minister, and he said, "What is up with Scientology?" And I said, "Well, you know." 20 pounds of crazy in a 10 pound bag, I think. But um, he said, but how can people believe that stuff? And I said, I think very simply, Cliff, there is a force for evil in the world who wishes to deceive us. 
and he is often successful, and he especially likes to deceive those people whose voices are going to be heard by a lot more people, like the Tom Cruises and the John Travolta's in the world. And so um, he said, really? You really? And I said, and it's the devil. And he said, do you really think the devil is real? And I said, absolutely, I think the devil is real. And he, did, he wants to destroy us. And one of the ways he does that is by blinding us to the truth and convincing us of falsehood. Even when that falsehood, with only a little bit of sense, you can see just how nuts it is. And he said, huh, wow, I never thought about that. Well, I hope the Lord does something with that in Cliffy's life. You know. But uh, if you have a driver in London, I've got somebody right into you. He said, when I told him I was a pastor, um, he said, oh, I love pastors. He said, there are these two black pastors from Southern California. You come over about every six months, and I drive them around, and they're slapping me in the back saying, Brother Cliffy, how you doing? You know, I'm just having a great time. So it was a good experience. But thank you, my friends. Today is over. Continue your reading. I'll let you know if you have any questions, and we will pick it up next week.